This is the Fly the W670 podcast. It's episode 24 of season number three. Cubs have roster decisions to make. Don't forget to listen, download, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Follow us on all the socials. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can email us at flythew670 at gmail.com. Crowley, happy uh, midweek, and uh, how is it uh, being back from Mesa? Uh, there's a little bit of an adjustment period. I'm not used to the weather. Um, I'm catching up on sleep, and uh, I've drunk nothing but water for the last 48 hours, so I think it, yeah, I'm off okay. to a good start. Good start. Uh, a couple of, a couple of bottles of Advil and a couple of gallons of water. Everything's perfect. Now we're back to normal here, but uh, we are, Dustin, getting near the end of spring training. And after today's game, Dustin, there's only five Cactus League games left and two exhibition games against the Cardinals who are coming from Florida and stopping over to Mesa before heading to Los Angeles to take on the Dodgers. So Yeah, that's kind of interesting, right? Yeah, that's kind of interesting. I did that in 2018. The, um, the Cubs actually came to Florida. They played the Red Sox. And because they were opening up in Miami, and the Marlins, yeah, as I say, is that ahead of the Marlins series? Okay, yeah, so they do that every now and then, and I think it's pretty cool. You know, you get to see a team that you usually don't get to see when you, if you go to a lot of Cactus League games. I have a lot of friends out in Arizona, they go to like 20, 25 games a, a spring, so you know, to see the Cardinals, that's a little bit different. So, it adds a little, you know, you know, that that rivalry is always a fun one. Yep, oh, yeah, great. Listen, uh, anytime you get a chance to beat the Cardinals is a good day, I don't care who's on the field. Well, the Cubs did not, were not able to beat the Oakland A's on today on Wednesday when we're recording this. Worst thing in the world, Dustin, when I hear the words bullpen game, I don't care if it's spring training, regular season, I, I can't stand it. Um, but you got to see a lot of the big names in there. Leiter Jr., Alzali, Merriweather, Quas, Edwards, Lovelady, and Keegan Thompson, all pitch scoreless innings. Hey, don't forget to listen to that Carl Edwards interview. is really good from the last episode. Unfortunately, Hector Neris did not as he gave up a leadoff home run, a single, got two strikeouts, but then gave up a two-run blast to Brent Rooker to put the athletics up three to nothing. Dustin, the, the Cubs offense was almost completely non-existent. Alexander Canario drew a walk, but that was wiped out with the David Bowie hit into a double play. The only hit in the game came in the seventh inning when Ezekiel Pagan hit a two run or a, hit a solo home run to make it a three to one game so that that was just awful bad bad day yeah but again who you know who, who was in the lineup right is that that's something we have to look at right yeah it was there was a lot of regulars in the lineup so when you were looking at it I mean it wasn't I mean they gave out some guys days off because of that played last night last night right and last night I know we're going to get to that game in a minute but last night I had a feel for watching the game a little bit last night looking at the at the lineup last night that felt like an opening day lineup to me potentially um, right. It wasn't all those guys, but the Cubs, the Cubs struck out 12 times against yeah. the Reds in that one. And, and that's a little troublesome as well. Yeah. I mean, they had Talkman, uh, Nico Horner, Cody Bellinger in there, uh, Cooper, Garrett Cooper, who's fighting for a spot, David Peralta, Miguel Amaya, Miles Mastroboni. I mean, we know he's going to be on there and Canario who drew a walk. So I'm saying last I mean, night, la last night was more of the what you would want in a day-to-day -day type of lineup as opposed to what was today. I'm yeah. When they only, when they were held to one hit. <laughs> one hit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Tuesday night was way more fun. Uh, Kyle Hendricks took the bump against the Diamondbacks. He was cruising Dustin for the first four innings. He gave up a single in the second and a single in the third, but there was a fifth inning. He ran out of gas. He gave up a single double and a single to put the snakes up one, nothing sack fly made it two nothing to fly out to center before giving up two more doubles his night was done with the Cubs trailing four to nothing. Hendricks went 4.2 innings and gave up seven hits, four runs with three Ks, but all four runs and five out of those seven hits came in that fifth inning. Dustin Kyle threw 84 pitches. So you could tell they're building up his arm strength. A lot yep. of the damage came, you know, off that curveball that he continues to work on. Yeah. But yeah, he, uh, he looked good early on, but, uh, disappointing that he ends up giving up those runs. But again, the biggest takeaway for me in that game was the amount of Ks that the Cubs offense had. Yeah, that, no good on that. No other reliever gave up a run. Hayden Wesniski went 1.1. Luke Little, another scoreless inning with two Ks. Mm -hmm. Dustin has not given up a run. Colton Brewer struck out all three batters he faced, and Joe Nehas finished it up. Um, Hendricks said, for the most part, we executed what we wanted, made a lot of good pitches, got the volume up. I feel good with that. All the ups. So a lot of positives overall. One more left, lock in, and get ready to go. Um, he has been experimenting with a curveball grip. And so what I've seen 
over a lot of these spring training games is it seems like a lot of the damage done on Hendricks happens on curveballs. Who knows? Uh, on offense, though, another night where the Cubs didn't do much. Shea stayed hot going one for one with a double and a walk. Morel was one for three. Master Boney one for two. Scored their only run in the seventh when Jorge Alfaro doubled and Jonathan Long hit a single to drive in the lone run. So they lost four to one. But Dustin, the problem happened that made me nervous was before the game, Patrick Wisdom was scratched from the game with a back issue. So Wisdom hit a walk off homer against the Brewers on March 12th. That was the day before I got to Mesa. He went two for three the next day with two RBIs against the Guardians on the 13th, but he has not played since then with back stiffness. And he was supposed to play yesterday on the 19th. He was in the lineup, but then was scratched. So, you know, Craig Council was talking about how he's going to get an MRI, which he got done, and they haven't released anything about that yet. But it's been a tough spring for uh, Patrick. He's had a quad issue and now this back issue. If he's not going to be ready for opening day and he's going to go on that IL, it's going to open up a roster spot. So we'll see what happens with that. When I was out in Mesa, the Cubs reduced the roster from 47 to 42 players. Right-handed pitcher Keegan Thompson and infielder Matt Mervis were optioned to Triple A, and three non-roster invitees were assigned to minor league camp. That was Cam Sanders, who we've been watching real close, right-handed relief pitcher, uh, catcher Bryce Windham, and infielder Chase Strum. So as we look at the roster, Dustin, we, there's decisions to be made, right? You got 42 players left, 22 pitchers, four catchers, nine infielders, six infielders, and one infielder outfielder. But as you kind of look at this, you know, there's 31 players right now in camp that are on the MLB on the Cubs 40 man roster. Those are guys like Kyle Hendricks, Dansby Swanson, and Cody Bellinger. Nine guys from the 40-man roster on the optional assignment to the minors. That's your PCA, your Ben Brown, the Matt Mervis. Guys that are on your 40-man roster but already got moved uh, down to minor league camp. Now, in addition, Dustin, there's 12 non-roster invitees to camp at this time. Five pitchers, Colton Brewer, Carl Edwards Jr., Edwin Escobar, Richard Lovelady, and Thomas Pannone. Now, with Caleb Killian going, on, most likely going on the 60-day IL, out of those five pitchers, Colton Brule, Carl Edwards, Edwin Escobar, Richard Lovelady, and Thomas Pannone, is there someone you kind of feel might get that spot that opens up? Lovelady's been okay, right? I mean, I, Thomas Pannone hasn't really – I haven't really noticed a lot. Carl Edwards has been there and done that, but there's been a little bit of rockiness. Um, that I would, say, I would say either Lovelady or Edwards probably of that group. Yeah, Edwards had a nice game today. I think, you know, I think he had one start where one or one or two appearances where he was a little bit rocky, but I, you know, to me if you're you're if I'm ranking it, I think it, it's probably between Edwards and and boys, between Love Lady and Brewer, but I, that's right. kind of what I'm looking at. All right. Now the two catchers, they're not going to be right. on the they're, roster. They're, yeah, those, those two catchers, yeah, those two catchers are gone. There's no doubt, there's no doubt about that. Now um, here here's where yeah. it gets interesting. You Very have interesting, right? Three infielders that are David Bodie, Garrett Cooper, Dominic Smith, and then David Peralta can play both infield and outfield. So we, it, it's to me, it's looking like wisdom. You know, the fact that they don't have results on the back is not a good thing yet. Right, and 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 the skipper council didn't sound very positive. And then I saw Nick Madrigal when I was in Mesa. He wasn't running, but he was swinging the bat, which is something. But now, you know, when we take a look at those names, when you long, look at Bodie Cooper, Dominic Smith, and David Peralta, that's where it kind of gets interesting. So with Bodie, he's already, the Cubs already have him under contract. I mean, he's going to be playing for the Iowa Cubs. He's not going to be making the, the roster. I know people are going to ask me why not. It, it's, you know, he, he's not playing second. I don't see him playing third. That's going to be Christopher Morrell's spot. Nico's there. He's just not. Um, but with Garrett Cooper, Dominic Smith, and David Peralta, that's where it gets interesting. On a lot of these guys that are non-roster invitees, they sign like a minor league contract with an invite to spring training, and then they are given an option later on. They, they, they're given opt-outs, right? So you have an opt-out. If you don't make the major league roster, you can opt out and hope to catch on with someone else. So my guess, especially with Garrett Cooper, Dominic Smith, and David Peralta, either one of those three if they get cut by the Cubs, if they are not on the major league roster, my guess 
is that they aren't going to be, they aren't going to try to go to Iowa. I think that they may try to catch on with someone else and opt out. Okay. That makes sense. I mean, I think if I had a pick out of those guys, like Garrett Cooper right now would make the most sense to me that that's where I'm at right now. Garrett Cooper is definitely like, you know, he would, I mean, if you think about it, Dustin, think about this guy, he's an all-star in Miami in 2022. I mean, it's not like ancient history and, and, no. and David, David Peralta is like 36, 37. I'm not saying he's not good, but when, when you look at Peralta's numbers, even, I mean, last year he was injured a lot, you know, so the numbers don't look good, but go prior to that, he, he hit 30 home runs in a season. I mean, the, again, good problems to have, but where we are right now in the scheme of things, it, my guess is by the next time we're talking on the podcast that they are going to be, we're going to see pretty much the team that they're going to roll with. Yeah. I mean, we're going to need to, right? I mean, that, that's where it's going to be at that point. We're going to need to see uh, exactly what, uh, what this team is going to look like. And I'm really excited, right? I'm really excited to see what this uh, opening day uh, of the Cubs roster roster looks like. So uh, a lot of good uh, things ahead for the Cubs Crowley. There's no doubt about that. It's getting exciting. We are about a week away from opening day. This is the Fly the W670 podcast. It's season number three. It's episode number 24. The Cubs have roster decisions to make. Don't forget to listen, download, and subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Of course, leave us a five-star review. In this segment, we continue our tour of the National League Central as Crowley interviews Kurt Hogg, the Brewers beat writer from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, to give our listeners, to give you some insight into the moves the Brewers have made as they make their push for another run at an NL Central title. Joining me now on the Fly of the W podcast, I'm happy to have on Kurt Hogg from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel as we continue our preview of the Cubs 2024 NL Central opponents. Kurt, how's it going out there in Arizona? Good, warm. Um, it's been a warm winter, you know, back up north, but uh, I, I I do like the 75 and sunny. It is It does beat 45 and windy and rainy. Oh yeah, you can say that again. I like I said, I'm getting my bags packed, and all I got are shorts and t-shirts, and I'm ready to go. I'm excited. So hopefully, you know, the Cubs are playing the Brewers pretty soon when we're recording this. But uh, I gotta say, you know, the I-94 uh, rivalry has gotten a little bit spicy this off season, like it needed any more spice. You got to take a look. The Brewers finished the season last year with a record of 92 and 70, and I'm telling you, Kurt, the thing that kills me is that the night. The Brewers won the Central as a night. Say a Suzuki dropped that fly ball in Atlanta, and it's just like, I mean, that's just putting salt in the wound. It was a bad. It was a bad night. <laughs> <laughs> Watching the Brewers celebrate while we're trying to figure out what the hell happened to that ball, but you know, the Brewers. I mean, they seem to just get bad luck because whoever they play in the postseason always goes on either the World Series or to win it. They were swept out by the Diamondbacks, but Kurt, to me, like you know, the story of the Brewers now in 2024 is is about all the you know you lost some big pieces since the end of that season and you know david stearns was named right in october beginning of october the mets president of baseball operations that wasn't really a surprise to anyone though is that fair to say no not a, not a surprise at all especially when he didn't take a job last winter i think i think Everyone and their mother was expecting David Stearns to go to New York. That was one of the the two big um, front office slash you know leadership role departures. Uh, and the other one was a total shock. I'm sure we'll get to that. But this <laughs> yeah. one, this one was not not one bit. Well, you know the thing is, is, is when Craig Council didn't sound an extension. You know, I, I sat there and I, I I said a whole bunch. I remember I remember talking to Glendon Rush before, and I was just like, I think I think Council is going to join Stearns in New York. Yeah, and and to me, it was either like Council was either going to go to New York with Stearns, or maybe he was going to take the Mets offer and leverage it to the Brewers to get more money. But instead, he shocks the baseball world. He signs with the Cubs for the largest managerial contract. We knew he interviewed with Cleveland and with mm -hmm. New York, but I mean, when that happened, I mean that was just a complete shock. How did the organization, the front office, the players, how did they react when the news about Council came out? Yeah, I think one of the stories of the Brewers offseason was, and this is, includes the hiring of Pat Murphy, is there was a the theme of continuity on on you know on the rest of the coaching staff um, on a lot of the roster decisions as well. Like they they brought the entire coaching staff back, um, and that, that feels a, a bit of 
like it's a message, uh, whether direct or indirect, to counsel that they're going to be successful, or at least in their minds, they, they plan on being successful without him as manager. So it's going to be interesting to watch because, you know, for the last five, six, seven, eight years, so much of the, the brewer success has been credited to the manager. The brewers themselves talk about how important he is to their success. And now he's gone. And, you know, the, the theme and the message, as soon as he signed with Chicago from ownership on down, you know, in, in direct quotes to the press was that Craig was a part of the success, but he was not the reason for the success. So we're going to find out this off season. Um, I mean, the, the roster's, probably worse than it was last year. So you can't tell, you know, an apples to apples comparison on this, but we're going to find out how important he was to their winning ways uh, being on the top step and, you know, how well Pat Murphy can be his successor after being the guy who was helping him work through all these decisions um, for all these years. It's, it is definitely the storyline of the year to follow. I think in the NL central for the brewers, for the Cubs, um, just overall. Now you're out in Arizona. Does the spring training camp, you talked about the continuity, all the coaches pretty much the same. Pat Murphy just fills the role that council vacated. Does the spring training camp feel the same or is there kind of like a little bit of a chippiness or edge or kind of bitterness about what happened? I don't, I don't think there's bitterness. I don't think there's a chippiness, especially when you think about players. These are guys who for sure understand, go, go get your bag, go get paid when you can. <laughs> um, Loyalty does not exist so much to most players, and there's a good reason and a good argument that it probably shouldn't. Like we saw what happened with JD Davis today um, in the Giants. Teams are going to cut you as in the moment that they can or they they have the opportunity to, and you're not playing up the up to par. So I think the players, to a large degree, get it. The holdovers get it, and they also had a, just a really good relationship with Council. Um, so while fans are perturbed by it, it's not so much from the players. But there is a different vibe in camp. There's a different vibe with Pat Murphy, and he's got a different style than than Craig Council. Um, and like, again, we'll, we'll we'll see how that style translates to wins and losses on the field. But he seems to connect pretty well uh, in the clubhouse. He has a lot of relationships with these guys, and you know, from a media standpoint, Pat Murphy's a whole lot different than Craig Council too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, you talk about the roster being different. And, and when I take a look at the, the players, you know, that, that are not no longer on the Brewers, you know, it, you, you look at offensively last year was just kind of, to me, when I look at the Brewers yeah. and I look at the offense, I mean, they were 23rd in average, 23 in OPS, 24th in home runs. I mean, offensively, they weren't very good, but, but it was really, you know, the pitching that was just, you know, starting pitching and especially relief pitching that really kind of propelled the Brewers to the central title. But, you know, two of the top guys that came over, you know, last year that were really successful, Mark Canna and Carlos Santana are gone. Rowdy Telez had a down year. I don't think you guys are going to be missing him all that much. But, I mean, those are some some big bats to have to replace offensively. I mean, I, I feel like the Brewers have done a pretty good job of supplementing the offense this year, which is important because – they're going to need to. It, it, <laughs> I've been saying and kind of joking for the, that for the last three, four years, I think people in Milwaukee might have forgotten that you can win by scoring runs too. <laughs> because for the, you know, since 2020, this team has won baseball games with pitching and defense. Last year, their offense was terrible and they still won 92 games because they had the best defense in baseball and the, like a top five, 10 rotation and the best bullpen. That's yeah. probably not the defense will be really good again this year, but that's probably not going to be the case with the pitching. They seem confident that they, that they can kind of piecemeal this thing together, but you look at the staff and there's a lot of question marks, a lot of question marks on performance, a lot of question marks on like workload and innings. And the, the, the lineup suddenly kind of looks like I don't want to say the strengths, I'm not sure, entirely sure, like it's going to be an, an elite or you know extremely above average group but you kind of look at yeah yelich you got Contreras, you got hoskins you've got uh all these uh, all these young guys some of them figure to work to the equation you got willie adamas jackson churio uh will probably be up on opening day it's not a bad unit so the offense should be better uh they'll probably miss a guy like mark canna but 
I feel like they did a pretty good job of replacing the guys they were losing. And they they did shed some performers who were pretty bad last year, like Rowdy Telez. Yeah, and you know, I know the Cub fans were really hoping to get uh, Reese Hoskins, so he's over in Milwaukee now. But you know, I think everybody knew sooner or later that Corbin Burns was going to be gone. I, I still don't get that arbitration what they did with that. A few was it twenty twenty two before twenty twenty three? Yeah, it was, it was last season. Yep. Yeah, I mean, it just didn't make sense, and 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 now he's gone, and so you you know you talk about Brandon Woodruff who had injuries last year, and 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 but you know losing Burns, it kind of just to me when I look at the rotation, it, it's just a whole lot different when you, everyone has to move up, and so you know you're looking at your starters, you got Freddie Peralta, and then would you say Wade Miley number two? Yeah, Wade Miley's number two. Uh, Aaron Aaron Ashby, and then after that, that's the great question. You, the Brewers <laughs> have, the Brewers have a lot of options and more and even more questions. I mean, even a guy like Wade Miley, who when he's out there, you have a good, a good feel that he's going to perform, but it's always a question of how much is Wade Miley going to be out there? I mean, he's already dealing with some, you know, some, some injury stuff now, and it's a question if he'll be ready for opening day. So Pat Murphy talks about this. He's like, we don't have guys that have proven that they can throw a lot of innings, even Freddie Peralta, who's now the opening day starter. I don't know what, what his career high innings is off the top of my head, but it's probably like 160. And that's kind of been one of the knocks on him is he doesn't go deep into games. So I think this pitching staff might get have to get a little creative with how they string together 27 outs on a nightly basis. And that's hard to do over the course of an entire season, but they do have a lot of talent, a lot of intriguing names. Ashby's intriguing. DL Hall, they, you know, the, the, the prize pitcher they got back for Corbin Burns. If you look at the Brewers' track record of developing pitchers, you think, you know, they could probably make this guy work. Joe Ross is there. Jacob Junis is kind of like a classic, like it feels like Yuli Chassin maybe all over again. Uh, there's Robert Gasser will be up. Um, Carlos Rodriguez, another young name. Bryce Wilson is being like toyed with as a potential starter. It's, it's, it's a weird uh, convergence of arms that, is happening this spring and I have no idea how it's going to look. Yeah. yeah. We, we, you know, we talked about Ken and we talked about Santana, but the other two guys that were really big offensively for the Brewers was William Contreras, who Cub fans are very familiar with and uh, Christian Yelich. Now Contreras, you know, I swear to God, you know, it's so funny to me that, that the Brewers traded to get him. I know it's a fan thing, but uh, with the amount that, uh, you know, Brewers fans hated Wilson Contreras and now you get William, but, but I, I mean, Christian Yelich seemed to have a pretty good bounce back year last year. I mean, is, I'm just wondering how possible that is again in 2024. There's good reason to believe he can do that version or similar of, of Christian Yelich again, because when he was, I won't say underperforming, but playing like a, a, a slightly above average big league player, like there was still some of the signs of, Really, really good Christian Yelich. Now, no one thinks he's going to be MVP Yelich again. 18, 19 Yelich, that's that's probably almost certainly in the past. But there were still some of those glimmers of, like, the elite play discipline, the really hard contact. In his down years from, like, 2020 through uh, 2022, and then last year it kind of started to piece it together a little bit. So we'll, we'll, we'll see if he can carry it over. I have no reason to think that he can't have another year like he had last year. His defense was a little bit better too, and that's I think that's going to be important. And with him, it's always health. Um, he's played through a lot of back problems in in recent years, and did a pretty good job of managing it last year and avoiding those those issues, which create a whole series of issues in his swing and his performance. So yeah, health health's going to be a big question for him. And when you look at what the Brewers need from him, they need him to be good. They need William Contreras to be good. They need Reese Hoskins to be good. Like that's the baseline. If the Brewers want to win, they need all those guys to be well above average hitters. Um, and then you kind of let the variance with the young guys come into play. Yeah. And we just had Jim Callis on the show the other day. And when you looked at MLB pipeline, he had the Cubs farm system at two, but the Brewers, I think were right there with three, and so, I mean, you know, with, with the Cubs and Milwaukee, both good farm systems right there. Um, you talked about Jackson Churio, and that was a huge signing. That, that, that's going to be very interesting to see how that contract plays out. How has he looked in your eyes so far in center field this, uh, this spring? In center field, he hasn't really gotten a ton of chances. So it's, it's, um, 
it's I guess to be determined how that plays out. A lot you talk to people around the Brewers, talk to scouts. They think he can play an average to above average center field. He's got the athleticism and like the baseball instinct to do it. He he doesn't look overmatched at the plate either. I mean it's spring, um, but you can kind of still tell when some guys are you know a, a, a step behind big league pitching, and that's certainly not the way I would describe his offense like the power hasn't entirely been there but he's still hitting you know over 300 um there but there we go with his spring training staff that definitely <laughs> matters but uh he he seems to have solidified the opening day center field job the brewers aren't committing to that but the vibe just seems to be that jackson Churio is going to be the center fielder all right and again you know it, it's it's all eyes are going to be on that contract because that was a pretty big contract to, to give somebody that hasn't played today but you know there's a lot of promise and if and if he is what the brewers think he's going to be then that deal looks like a bargain later on as, as we just saw with you know otani making what 800 million dollars it's pretty you know pre- pretty good deal if, if it works out for the brewers now i know that the cubs and brewers first play each other in milwaukee i want to say memorial day on that monday uh, I think it, it's around it's around Memorial Day. Might be a weekend wraparound series. I'm not I don't know the exact dates, but it is late late May in Milwaukee. Yeah, it drives me nuts with this new 30 team schedule that you know it's going to be late you know late May before we see the Brewers. But what kind of reception are you expecting? Are you expecting you know when 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 Craig comes back? I know there was some bad blood originally, but when when it come when the Cubs come into Milwaukee, it always is kind of you know a little bit heated. You think it's going to be any worse now that Craig Council is going to be wearing the Cubby blue when he goes over to Ampham? Uh, you, you mentioned the 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 reception to the move was, was heated right off the bat. And I expected it to cool down. I expected Brewers fans to kind of like simmer. Okay. They'll get over it. That didn't happen. (laughs) 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 A lot of people are still very upset at Craig council. And I don't think that's, I don't think that's going to go away. I think when the season begins, that's probably only going to go up. So uh, as far as the reception goes, it depends on how many Brewers fans are in the ballpark. It's, I think it's going to be a hot ticket. Um, Cubs fans always love coming to Milwaukee. Um, and, and I think over like in recent years, there's like a very large contingent of Brewers fans that are like, I, I just don't want to be a part of that, you know, that back and forth 50 50 experience at the ballpark. But for this series, it, I, those Brewers fans might turn back out. So uh, it's going to be, it's, like if you've been if you've been to Amfam Field or Miller Park for a Cubs Brewers game, you know that seventh inning stretch, um, take me out to the ball game, a unison scream, one side screaming Cubbies, the other one's Brewers. It's going to be that times like five um, for the initial Craig Council introduction, which in the grand scheme of things matters absolutely none, but it'll be fun <laughs> to see anyway. Absolutely. And hopefully everybody's in a good mood once they do the roll out the barrel. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta just remember that this is all for fun and, 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 and not take it that seriously. You know, it, it's, I, I always like going to Miller park or Ampham. you know, it, it to me is a great park and, and, you know, I like tailgating and we always have a big group that kind of goes out there. So I'm hoping it's, like I said, I kind of got a feeling it's going to be a little bit chippy, but, but a little bit chippy. We'll, you know, hopefully both teams will be pretty good. Now I talked about the farm systems. Is there anybody, obviously Sal Freilich is a guy and Jackson Churio, you know, we, we talked about, but is there anybody that you're kind of thinking that, Hey, this guy's not really on a lot of people's radars just yet, but has a really could has a chance to do, you know, make the squad and, and possibly play an important role for the Brewers in 2024. Yeah. Um, in 2024, the Brewers have a lot of guys that are kind of like right on that doorstep. Um, Jacob Mizorowski gets a lot of hype as you know the, the fireballing um, arm. Jefferson Caro's maybe the team's third catcher this year. I think I'm going to go with Robert Gasser. If you're looking for like an under the radar kind of guy, his stuff has looked really good this spring, um, and that's something that kind of does matter a little bit in the spring. Is you know what what Velo a guy's throwing with, um, how his pitches are moving, how he's commanding, and so he's looked pretty good this spring. I'm not entirely sure. I don't think he's going to make the team out of camp. But it would not shock me if Robert Gasser makes 15, 16 starts for Milwaukee this year. Um, he's he doesn't have like overpowering stuff, but you know, lefty, good athlete, good pitch ability, understands how it works, good mix, five, six pitches. So th- yeah, very good farm systems that should keep this rivalry heated and intense for years <laughs> to come. Uh, and you could pick from you could pick from a wide list of names, honestly, for 
young guys that are going to impact the Brewers this year. Uh, have no idea which ones are going to be good, and that's why this Brewers season is such a weird mystery ahead of us. Uh, it'll be fun to see how it unfolds. Now, yeah, just taking a look really quick at the Pakoda. I still don't understand how St. Louis is that high up, but they have the Cubs with 80 wins and Milwaukee at 78 and Cincinnati at 78. I mean, I think everybody I've talked to, you know, all the different beat writers from the NL Central, I mean, I think it's going to be a dogfight. I really do think that it is anybody's division to win. And I think that's what's going to, you know, add that with the Craig Council to Chicago. And I, I just, I have a feeling this is just going to be one heck of a season. Yeah, I'm not going to confuse it with a good division, but it <laughs> might be an interesting, compelling, and fun one. You know, there's, pl there's plenty of bad blood uh, brewing in this division already. Um, you know, maybe I feel like the Reds are the team maybe that doesn't have like really a lot of bad blood. So we'll see how they manage to get into the <laughs> into the the rivalry uh, scheme of things this year. But I, I honestly don't know who I would pick to win the division. Um, it's it's going to be it's it should be tight and what, like 86, 87 wins feels like it might just be good enough because you have a bunch of teams that are OK, but none that are great. And it was interesting because if you take a look at the pipeline, you have the Cubs at two, the Brewers at three, and I think it's the Pirates at nine and Cincinnati at 10. So you have four teams in the NL Central that have, you know, that are in the top 10 of the pipeline system. I, I got a feeling that this is going to be a good division, you know, moving forward. But Cubs, Brewers, no matter what happens, it, it is always enjoyable. I, I enjoy it. And hopefully, like I said, you know, a good competition, a healthy, fun competition. And I think it's going to be really a fun season to watch. Kurt, where can our listeners find your work and where can they follow you on the socials to keep up with all things Brewers? If you want to read about the Brewers, which we have a lot of content on, uh, jsonline.com, Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. I'm on Twitter. X, no, it's, twi it's, no, it's Twitter. Uh, at Kurt Hogue <laughs> with a Y, C-Y-R-T-H-O-G-G. I'm looking forward to the year ahead. It's going to be a fun one. All right, Kurt. And I hope to maybe see you out in Arizona. Thank you so much for jumping on and we'll do this again in the future. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. This is the fly, the W670 podcast season three, episode 24. The Cubs have some roster decisions to make. Don't forget, download, subscribe, review, and download the podcast and give us a five-star review. Please, please, please. All right, Crowley, Sammy finally made his return to Chicago for the first time in 17 years. He visited a Shriners Hospital, Club 400, Gibson Steakhouse, who doesn't visit Gibson's when they come back to town, mm -hmm. and the Chicago Sports Spectacular that I'm surprised didn't change their uh, events since you weren't available to be there. Uh, <laughs> in this segment, Crowley talked with Phil Smith about Sammy's very busy, busy weekend as he returned to town. I am happy to have back on the fly the W podcast my good friend Phil Smith. Phil, how are you doing tonight? Paul, how are you, sir? It's great to be I, back in the clubhouse, man. <laughs> I got to tell you, you know, it, I think we're all recovering from a lot of wildness this weekend. Um, I was in Mesa. You were with Sammy Sosa all weekend as we he made his return to Chicago. We had you on recently with Mitch Adelstein of the Chicago Sports Spectacular. And I wish I was there, but from all the stories, all the pictures, everything I've read, it just seemed like it was a phenomenal weekend. Uh, no doubt. It uh, actually was, uh, we were running on adrenaline, just about, I think all of us were running on adrenaline. There were uh, four of us and uh, it was, uh, it was well, actually five of us, including the gentleman who drove uh, was an off-duty Rosemont uh, police officer. So it was action packed. It was go, go, go from 745 on Friday morning, or even from when he, uh, he landed Thursday night and there, I don't know, there was like 20 people. We turn around as he's getting off the plane. I turn around, there's 20 people standing there with Sammy Sosa stuff to sign, you know, and they, I, they, they figured out how to get in there and I give him credit. Hey, you know, 17 years since Sammy has been in Chicago. I mean, it just, it had to be kind of just jaw dropping to actually see him back there. And I wonder, as he was leaving O'Hare, was he just kind of amazed and looking around to be back in Chicago where he spent so many great years? Well, I'll tell you, you know, he got off. We had a cart. We had the, I got the white glove treatment for him, right? And he gets in a cart. Anybody who stopped, or should say, hey, Sammy, how you doing? He would say, stop the cart. And he'd get on. And he goes, come on, let's take a picture. He's <laughs> telling people, let's take a picture. 
and they were just totally enamored by how kind and how nice he was. And it took us a while to get down the baggage and we get down the baggage and there were three or four Chicago cops standing there. Cause of course, you know, it's the O'Hare's in Chicago. And, uh, he went over and said, let's take a picture guys. He shook their hands and talked to him. And he said, thank you so much for welcoming me back. Welcome me back. And they were waiting on baggage. And this woman walks over to me and she goes, is that Sammy Sosa? And I go, yeah. And I go, what do you want a picture? She goes, there's no way he wants a picture with me. I go, Sammy picture. He goes, Oh, tell her to come here. And he talked to her for about five minutes. I mean, he was extremely accessible. Couldn't have been any kinder. And, uh, and he was there with us, Sammy Sosa Jr., his son, which is, He's a stellar human being. They both were just fen phenomenal the whole weekend. And one of the things that Sammy really wanted to do while he was here is to visit a hospital, a Shriners hospital. And, and this is a picture of you and Sammy um, at the Shriners hospital. And then when I looked at all the pictures and just saw him with all these kids that, you know, definitely just needed some cheering up, it looks like to me. It really, really kind of hit the heartstrings on that one. I mean, that picture alone, uh, if you went back to the young man, that's total prosthetics. The nurse behind him was holding him up so he could walk, right? Because if you think the prosthetics, it, it, he's totally off balance. And, you know, it's his mom behind him. He's from Miami. So that right away, he, uh, of course, Sammy hits it off. But his mother's from columbia and it was nothing but smiles and you know the, the kids in that era right there they don't know who he was but by the time he left they'd know who he was right and uh it was heartwarming if you uh if you're a real true person with integrity and character if you didn't have a tear in your eye um after you know that hour and a half at the hospital then you know god bless you you get bigger problems and you were telling me the story that basically they had to ask Sammy to leave. He was spending so much time that the kids were getting exhausted. Yeah, yeah. He, um, I mean, the staff came walking out. He took pictures with everybody. He talked. You know, it's interesting. Most people didn't want autographs. They just wanted a picture with them, right? You know, there's a picture of a little girl who was scared. She didn't know what to do. And then and when is he get, he's getting ready to walk out, she says, will you shoot baskets with me? He's like, ah, let's go shoot them. <laughs> and, and that's right. Um, he wasn't, he said, uh, it was interesting because it's like, well, Mr. Sosa, you're going to have to leave now. He's like, did I do something wrong? She goes, no, no, no. The kids are exhausted, you know? <laughs> so um, he could have stayed there for a long time. He was a great ambassador. He was even more intrigued by the fact that our hospital here in Chicago, uh, one of 22 hospitals, has actually uh, brought Dominican children up uh, to help them with either scoliosis or club feet or club pallets or it's an orthopedic hospital there on Oak Park in Chicago. That's just absolutely amazing. And so you guys also are going to take a car and you're going to go to club 400 of our friend, mutual friend, Stuart McVicker, and this, this picture of him hopping out and smiling and, and, you know, knowing Stuart, as long as I have to see him, him giving Sammy that big bear hug. Stu's always told me, you know, I built Club 400 to hope one day that Sammy would come back. And that was always his big get. If, if, if one day if Sammy could just come back and, 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 and there he is signing the wall. It, it, it's, I, I also have this picture of Stu and Sammy and Anthony Rizzo. And he's looking at this giant bobblehead. And that, that picture right there, though, kind of was like, oh, my, you know, just all the stuff that Sammy missed. I'm just so glad he's back now to kind of start reconnecting with the fans. Well, that's what, and that's what he did, right? Um, because, you know, there was, uh, there was some talk around that, well, there's no way Sammy went out to Club 400 out there in the western suburbs. No, he did. And he was so jazzed from the hospital trip that the time it took to get out there is the time that we took to actually talk about the experience, right? That uh, he, he, was, he was overwhelmed in some ways. But I always had a grin on his face, and he was the one. There was one young lady that you may or may not have a picture, but this is really what was cool, and I think this is where it, it, I had to walk away because I was going to lose it. Um, she couldn't talk. She was in a wheelchair, and she was all ready for St. Patrick's Day, and she could only talk from her iPad. And she said, you know, she came over and, and just gravitated and said, you know, on her iPad, I like you, and can, and can I sing? you a song through my iPad. And I was like, whoa, uh, wow, that's heavy. So like I said, um, I offer this to anybody in the press. Um, you know, GN was there, but um, 
press or Mr. Ricketts, if you'd like to come out to the Shriners Hospital, I'll pour, personally escort you um, through the uh, hospital, and, uh, and and hopefully you will see the rewards of some really passionate and hardworking kids, let alone the staff and the doctors that give their all to something like this. And you mentioned WGN and here, and that's where Jared Payton did yeah. the interview in club 400 with Sammy. And this picture right here of the two of them is on, you can see that on the 670, the score YouTube channel. It's, it's, uh, I, I remember very clearly, you know, that relationship between Sammy Sosa and Walter Payton years ago. And, and to see Jared being able to interview Sammy Sosa, you know, you talk about getting choked up, you know, Walter left us way too early. And, and and to see Jared get, getting that opportunity to interview Sammy Sosa really brings, I think, things really full circle for a lot of Cubs and Bears fans, Chicago fans. Yeah, and let me add to that too because I had thought when I had put this whole this whole <laughs> schedule together and, and worked through it in my mind, I was like, who would be the best person for the interview? Well, Jared Payton, of course, for multiple reasons, and also a lot of people know that uh, one of the last room. Last, what is it, right? Last times actually Walter was in the public eye was when he threw out the first ball for opening day in April 1999, and he threw that to Sammy. And as he shared with me, my father understood what Sammy was going through by being in the public eye. You know, the fact that you want to go out to dinner with your son and just have some son time and father and son time and you know, someone wants your autograph and it, you have to be on 24 7, 365. And that situation for Jared being 19 years old at the time and knowing his dad was very, very ill, um, he's still to this day, that was one of the highlights of his life, believe it or not. So it's a great story. All these stories are so phenomenally positive in a world of crazy, right? Yeah. And, and so today, Club 400 put out a video the other day of, of the whole. Uh, Sammy coming over for the interview and, and John Benedict, our good friend, Cubs organist was there, but as Stu's showing Sammy around, he, you know, Stu tells him, Hey, we're going to have the organist here. And all of a sudden Sammy said, well, my son could play. So I thought here's Sammy Sosa jr. Playing a Lowry organ that was at Wrigley field. And he yeah. played it really, really well. He uh, self-taught. He's never taken a lesson in his life. He's pretty impressive. He actually, sat down at the, uh, we have a piano at the Shriner Hospital, and he sat down and played and got a, a, an ovation by the doctors and the nurses. That's how good he is, and he's self-taught. And uh, very humble, very humble um, young guy, you know, 27 years old, uh, really enjoyed being around on the weekend. Now, after that, because the day's still going on Friday, you guys have a special VIP dinner that Mitch Adelstein, Chicago Sports Spectacular, you, Gibson's all put together. And, you know, of course, if you're going to be back, you got to go to Gibson's. There, there's Sammy Sosa's special homecoming menu. Yeah. And you got to MC the Q&A. And it just yeah. from, I had two or three friends that were actually there that night. Oh, really? uh, Stuart being one of them. Yep. Right. And, and they just all talked about how awesome it was to have kind of that small private venue to kind of just have like a little one-on-one -on -one time with Sammy. Well, it was interesting because uh, two of the gentlemen that had attended, one had come from Virginia and one had come from Philadelphia just for the dinner. And that said a lot, just not the folks that were hanging out at the gate when we landed, which, when he landed, which was amazing. But, you know, how far these guys came just for the dinner. And those who thought about it and didn't do it actually missed an incredible experience because, um, yeah, I emceed and, and uh, we talked about different things. And, and Sammy Jr. actually had a very heartwarming um, message for the group and his relationship and how much he loves his father. And that the fact he, you know, he's 11 years old and Sammy didn't know his son that well. And now they're beyond tight. You know, they do everything together. And Sammy, you know, has six kids now from nine to 31. So, I was asked, what is Sammy doing the last 17 years? Well, obviously, he's been having kids and raising a family and actually makes his kids lunch before they go to school, which I found to be humorous. <laughs> but back, back real quick to the uh, the dinner, two things here. One, uh, Stuart uh, Club 400 uh, provided two big banners. And, uh, of course, Stuart came in for just that day and turned around and flew back for Club 400 out in Mesa. But... Um, 
what we did is Stu said, what do you want to do with the banners? You know, do whatever you want. And instead, what I did is I said to both of these gentlemen, um, Stu, you know, he wants someone to have those banners. You know, the guy from Virginia, you get first pick because you came the furthest. And the gentleman from Philadelphia, you can have the other one. Absolutely blown away. There were folks in that room that couldn't talk. That's how cool it was. It was just, yeah, there's the banner right there, right? And then um, on top of that, the interview that had been uh, produced and edited that afternoon aired that night on WGN. And I asked Gibsons if they could open up, you know, the room. And also uh, they had flat screen TVs. And if they had access, we sat there and my message was, folks, this is like sitting in Sammy's living room. We're all going to watch this interview together. And they were blown away. So the same interview that's been circulating on WGN, we all got to see it together. And then Sammy saw it for his first time too. So it was very um, cool. That's amazing. And and so, you know, that was plenty enough for one day, but Sammy still had two more days at the Chicago Sports Spectacular, which is held three times a year. And, you know, I, I've gone there many, many a times to the Spectacular. And the thing I always love is kind of seeing the interaction between the different athletes. Like sometimes it's not even the same sport. Sometimes it is. You know, when you when I remember there was one time when I was there that I was getting an Anthony Rizzo autograph and Andre he just passed Andre Dawson on the home Cubs career home run list. And as I'm sitting there waiting to get an autograph, here comes, you know, Andre Dawson behind Anthony Rizzo and said, congratulations, son, on moving ahead of me. And Anthony Rizzo couldn't have been nicer. You know, thank you, sir. I, you know, a huge honor coming from you, a Hall of Famer. You, you know, it was so great. And so when I got to see some of these pictures of the different athletes with Sammy at the spectacular. I'm putting these up again. Uh, here's Sammy Sosa with the Hulkster Hulk Hogan. Yep. Here is, this is Sammy Sosa. This you're there, Smitty. Uh, Julian yep. Martinez is there and Mike Tyson, Iron Mike. Again, yeah, going Mike back. To the just, <laughs> it was interesting because Mike was having dinner and we were walking in and, he, and Sammy goes, Hey, Hey champ. And, and Tyson just almost jumped over the table. He was so excited to see the big hugs. And then on the way out, um, you know, we got a picture taken with, uh, iron Mike and all that kind of stuff. And it was, uh, I just, the celebrity interaction was phenomenal. Like when Frank Thomas of the, uh, white Sox walked in the room, he, he lifted Sammy off the ground and just was just ear to ear grins. Everybody was just so happy in most cases to say hello like that one with sugar ray leonard and sugar ray leonard's brother uh, sugar ray is just a sweet guy and when he's, he's he uh, heard sammy was getting his pictures you know done <laughs> uh came running in and said get over here and he wrote you know you're a champion you're back and that's what that picture is so it that's, was that's honored. i'm honored because i was i was there for the whole thing you know i saw 90 percent of what was going on the whole time and you know, grown men and women were crying and some couldn't even talk. And he would make sure that, you know, there, were, there was a, a push to get three people, get people through the line. Sammy wouldn't let that happen. He says, this is my day. If you want to talk to me, say hello, you want to take a picture with your phone, that's fine. You know, and uh, I, I don't, I don't, everybody was, it was incredible. Right. I mean, just the kindness and, and no one knew what to expect. And I can tell you that sometimes, you know, when you do these autograph signings, you never know, you know, what the athlete's going to be like, what kind of day they're having. I mean, I've been to times where guys would barely even look up. I've been other times where guys that are having side conversations with the athlete next to them, not even really talking at all to anybody. And, 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 you know, this is, these are pictures of my friend, Tom Warman's collection. He had uh, a helmet signed, a bat signed, photos signed, like all these people that have been waiting Sammy to, you know, get yep. Sammy on all this stuff. I think it makes a big deal when you treat people with kindness, because I, like I said, I've been to these where sometimes they're like cattle calls and they don't really pay attention. And when the athletes are, are taking a minute or two and, and, and not just punching in and punching out. It, it changes the way that your your opinion of that athlete when you get those awesome experiences. But, but it's also the handlers, right? The people that are his assistants. And that is, it's, you know, if you think about it, it's what's the first initial impression. And if, you know, someone is saying, you better hurry up, get your stuff out of the bag and get ready and next, 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 that reflects on the actual, you know, sports celebrity ever whoever may be. I won't share with you who the individual was, 
but his handlers was they were very brace abrasive and i heard about it how wow you know i i thank people every time hey thank you for your support thank you for being here and they're like i wouldn't miss it for the world and the people are like big eyes like i can't believe i'm hearing this but you know kill the world with kindness it uh, and positive karma and it always comes back as a positive i look at it that way and and you know so many like i said just just all these people that i know i've gotten autographs and had a great time there and i just keep thinking that life is short and you know i guess having Sammy come back and, and, and have some time in Chicago, it just brings a lot of really positive memory memories for me, for other cub fans. You know, I'm here in the man cave right now and I got a picture of Sammy doing the hop signed over there. I got <laughs> Sammy with the flat flag from 2001 after nine 11. Uh, just, there's just a lot of memories. And I think sometimes when you're growing up, it, these athletes are like, kind of like the soundtrack of your life, whether it's music or sports or whatever. And, and, and just, just having Sammy back, I think it's, it's, I hope this this is the start of something big, and and I'm really excited that it happened, and I just wish I was there for it. Yeah, but well, but he'll, I, be, he'll be he'll he'll be back at some point. You know, I mean, it took 17 years, but I guarantee you won't it won't be 17 days, and it certainly won't be 17 years. But you know, you brought up the hop. Um, you know, he told me if you're going to continue to play fast pitch baseball, I expect you to hop when you when you go. When I said what when I'm running the third base instead of first, and he thought that was funny. <laughs> And then the other funny part was, and this is if you watch that video with uh, Club 400, the in, you know there's a inside joke, and that was my phone when I get a text that says, "Say hello to my little friend from uh, Scarface." And he, when that first happened, I thought he was going to fall over crying. He was laughing so hard. So that was our big joke for you know the the weekend. Well, you know when I think about everything, Phil, I know all the work that you Mitch Edelstein, the Chicago sports spectacular, Stu McVicker, like the time, the energy, th this was not, you know, just make a phone call and the guy shows up. This, this was, you know, there was a lot of emotion to it um, for a lot of people and a tremendous amount of work from all you guys to put something like this together for the fans of Chicago. That's why I wanted to kind of have you on to just uh, thank you and thank, you know, Mitch and Stu and everybody involved in this. There's more people that I could, you know, I'm probably forgetting people. I know Sue McVicker helped set so much up over at the con. There's so much, the people at the Shriners hospital, everybody that worked to make this weekend possible, you know, I, well, I'm, everybody's I'm, not going to be liking everybody, but I can tell you right now from the cup fans, I talked to the diehard cup fans. I talked to this was a very positive experience all the way around. Well, I'll just add this is that, you know, typically Stu and his team will hear, they'll, you know, you always hear the negative right in life. We all know that. Uh, but as he shared with me when I spoke to him at the end of the show, he, they didn't have one complaint about Sosa. People were gloating about it. The Rosemont police couldn't have been any kinder. They were gloating. The Chicago police, as I shared, um, you know, the American Airlines concierge group, the ladies there just took total care of him and they were blown away because he would not let up until he took a picture with them. They said, we're not allowed to do that. And he's like, no, you're taking a picture with me. Otherwise, <laughs> I'm going to call somebody. So he he went out of his way to make sure and he did it out of the out of his heart. He didn't just do it to try to impress people. That's who the man is. And then getting to know Sammy Jr., um, was even more priceless to me. So, I mean, just it, uh, how many people he touched and, you know, the, the, the guy, oh, here's one last story. The guy who came in from, he came in from, where is he? Atlanta, I think it was. He flew home Saturday morning because he had a business meeting and then turned around and flew back on Sunday just because it was such a great experience. He wanted to get Sammy's autograph and say, thank you again. That's pretty intense. Yeah, that is intense. And Phil, again, you do a lot of work for the Shriners. And so if, if where would our listeners be able to help contribute money to uh, the Shriners Hospital? Well, I would just say, you know, here locally is the big help. We do comedy nights and things like that. And we have a sportsman thing coming up. And now that the uh, oh, last thing, too, is the hospital said that they would be more than happy to start bringing in kids from the Dominican, as I said earlier. I mean, so all these little dots that we're connecting, I think you'll be surprised what the end result is and that uh, we will probably be seeing the Sosas uh, sooner rather than later. Um, so I would just say look out for us. You can, you know, 
we do commercials at night, late night TV stuff like that. But um, you know, j just stay positive for the kids. And uh, if there's a local event, or here's the other thing, we also will sell raffle tickets at various concerts for downloads and CDs, and a chance to win sometimes a signed guitar. We'll be doing Foreigner and uh, and also what is it? Foreigner and Sticks, excuse me, in August. But Foreigner is a big supporter of ours too. And uh, they've done an actual video and special CD for the Shriners. So I think you're going to hear more about us, especially in the Chicago area, especially after this experience. So thanks for thanks for the support, uh, Crowley. I appreciate it. Abs absolutely. And if our listeners feel inclined, you can go to Shrinerschildrens.org and go make sure you click on the Chicago location because, you know, that's where Sammy was and that's, where, Phil, where you do a lot of your work. So we really appreciate everything. And thank you, Phil, for taking a few minutes to come talk to us. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for the opportunity. And, and uh, you know, thank you for the people of Chicago and all your listeners and pod listeners, whatever you want to call them, for really supporting Sammy right now. It meant a lot to him, man. It really, really, really did. And uh, just just think positive. That's all. It's all positive. It's great. It, it's just man. the beginning. I'm a lucky man. I'm a very lucky man. I can't believe I got pulled off, but yeah, I'm a lucky guy. Well, thank you so much, Phil, and you take care. Bye-bye. All right, Crowley, that's a wrap. Don't forget, listen, download, review, subscribe to the Fly the W podcast. Follow on all the socials, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Of course, you can email Crowley and I, fly the w 670 at gmail.com, and you can watch us. That's right. You can see Crowley and I do this on the YouTube by subscribing to the 670 score. YouTube channel. Crowley, enjoy the uh, rest of the week. And uh, by the time we get back, we will be very, very close to uh, opening day down in Arlington. And who knows, we might be recording this and you may be doing it from Arlington, right? Absolutely. I will be down in, I will be in Austin and then I will be heading over to um, Arlington on Wednesday, right, be, right before opening day. So I am once again, I really didn't have to unpack too much. I'm just getting another suitcase and getting ready to go. But, hey, we're going to have everything for you on the Fly the W podcast. Go Cubs! Hey, guys, it's Crawley. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date with our latest episodes. Links are in the description. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Go Cubs!